Hello boys and girls. Got uh, another video for you fine folks on the internet uh, here today. Uh, another installment in the Matthew Buckley Talks Music series. Looking at another uh, popular folk rock album from the 1970s. Uh, today, uh, pardon me. Today we got uh, American Beauty by the Grateful Dead. Released initially in uh, November of 1970. Uh, by Warner Brothers Records on vinyl, 8-track, and cassette in U.S. and Canada. Uh, concurrently issued uh, by Warner Brothers and Seven Arts Records uh, in New Zealand, Germany, and U.S. And uh, also issued by Reprise Records on reel-to-reel, -reel, uh, quarter-inch, four-track stereo uh, reel tape. Um, in 1971, it was reissued uh, in the United Kingdom on vinyl and 8-track. Uh, and again, that same year, uh, in Australian, French, Italian, and German markets. Repressed in uh, 1973 on vinyl for U.S., German, and U.K. markets. Uh, reissued the next year in 1974 uh, for U.S. markets. Again, the next year in 1975 for Canadian markets. Uh, again, the next year in 1976 for U.S. markets. Uh, they skipped 1977, but there was another vinyl reissue uh, in the U.S. in 1978. And then uh, the next year in 1979, another Canadian vinyl reissue. And that same year, uh, the United States would see a Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab limited edition uh, vinyl reissue. Uh, a couple years later, there was a Spanish import reissue. Uh, and I followed in a couple years by another uh, United States vinyl issue. And the next year, uh, the Spanish would see a reissue of the album on both vinyl and cassette. Um, and in 1987, the first CD issue would be published for U.S. markets, concurrently with a cassette reissue for Canadian and U.S. markets. And the next year, in 1988, there would be a more widespread European CD reissue, uh, followed the next year by a German-specific CD reissue. And then uh, in a couple of years after that, in 1991, there was a Japanese CD reissue, uh, the same year as a European vinyl reissue, the first vinyl issue in 12 years. Um, a a few years later, in 1995, there was a Japanese CD reissue, and then another in 1998. Um, and in 2001, there was actually an Indian CD reissue um, for markets in India, um, which is interesting to me. Uh, in that same year, Warner Brothers and Rhino Records uh, issued a DVD audio disc uh, with a multi-channel mix. Uh, for U.S., German, and Japanese markets. Um, uh, oh, excuse me. In 2003, uh, there was a, an, a, a high-definition uh, CD, an HD CD uh, reissue by Warner Brothers for uh, European and U.S. markets, including some bonus tracks. And in uh, 2004, the next year, uh, there was a hybrid dual-disc reissue. Uh, one side of the disc having HD CD encoding and the other side having a DVD encoding, including the multi-channel DVD audio mix as well as some bonus video footage, which is neat. Um, a couple of years later, in 2006, Warner Brothers and Rhino Records reissued the uh, HD CD for U.S. markets. And five years later, in 2011, uh, the album got its first vinyl reissue in 20 years uh, on 180 gram vinyl for US, UK, and European markets. And two years later, there was a limited edition Japanese super high material HD CD uh, in 2013. Uh, the next year, in 2014, there was a, a pair of Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab uh, reissues. The, First being a uh, an original master recording gain two ultra analog 45 RPM 180 gram limited edition numbered special edition vinyl reissue. Um, so basically a half speed mastered edition of the album spread over two vinyl that's that's mastered at 45 RPM for 
very good sound. That's the idea. And uh, that same year, uh, Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab put out uh, an original master recording ultra disc UHR limited edition numbered special edition uh, hybrid super audio CD. So again, very pristine sound. Uh, the next year, Warner Brothers uh, put out a 45th anniversary red, clear, and blue swirl vinyl reissue. Uh, followed uh, a couple, a few years later in 2018 by a Newberry Comics limited edition gold and sunshine swirl vinyl. Uh, but most recently in 2020, for the 50th anniversary of the album, uh, it was reissued in a slew of formats as a uh, standard black 180-gram uh, vinyl reissue, as a limited edition crimson rose red color vinyl, as a special... American Reality Custom Color Vinyl, uh, exclusively available through Dead.net, uh, their website in limited quantities, and also available as this limited edition picture disc, I believe, according to the hype sticker, limited to 15,000. Um, these were issued alongside a CD reissue put here in this uh, nice uh, digipack slipcover with an embossed cover featuring uh, bonus content of a concert recorded roughly four months after the album's release. So there's quite a history with uh, a release history for this album. Now for anyone who might somehow uh, not be familiar with the uh, American phenomenon that uh, is the Grateful Dead, I'll give a little uh, background here. It won't be too in-depth as there's literally entire books that have been written about the the Dead's history, and you could easily write a book on their formation alone without even getting into the, you know, the band's early years or their 30-year career or their lasting influence and legacy. But uh, I digress. The Grateful Dead were formed in 1965 in Palo Alto, California, from the ashes of a jug band called Mother McCree's Uptown Jug Champions, led by banjo player and guitarist Jerry Garcia, uh, guitar player Bob Weir and singer uh, singer har singer and harmonica player Ron Pigpen McKernan. Uh, after gigging for some time under the name The Warlocks, having added uh, Bill Kritzman on drums and classically schooled musician Phil Lesh on bass guitar, the group changed uh, their name after hearing about another band that uh, had scored a recording contract with the same name. Uh, they rechristened themselves the Grateful Dead and became something of a house band for what would become known as the Acid Tests, a series of psychedelic parties hosted by uh, author Ken Kesey and his group of friends uh, who referred to themselves as the Merry Pranksters. The band would go on to play regularly at the Fillmore Auditorium in San Francisco, and developed a dedicated following in the local area amongst hippies and acid heads. They also formed a relationship with Owsley Bear Stanley early on, an audio engineer and chemist who would go on to oversee the band's live sound and also supply them and their fans with a steady stream of potent LSD. Uh, they were they would become an integral part of the evolving hippie scene in Southern California, uh, playing outdoor festivals and even living in the Haight-Ashbury district of California, um, San Francisco, of California specifically, I should say. Um, their self-titled debut album, released in spring of 1967, was warmly received in the San Francisco Bay Area, but the band were allegedly, well, not allegedly, they were ultimately uh, disappointed and felt that it didn't capture the energy and musical explorations that could be found on stage. Uh, to this end, their second album, uh, Anthem of the Sun, released in summer of 1968, was assembled through a collage-esque approach in which studio recordings were edited together with live material to create hybrid audio. In some cases, separate live performances were stitched together, and further studio overdub sessions followed. The band was, again, not entirely satisfied, 
and uh, Jerry Garcia would oversee a remix of the album in 1971 for future releases. During the initial recordings, the band added keyboardist Tom Constantin and a second drummer, Mickey Hart, to the fold. Uh, they would go on to record and release Aoxa Moxoa at the beginning of the summer of 1969, which th that album is arguably the apex of their 1960s psychedelic experimentation, recorded on 16-track and incorporating the lyrical contributions of Robert Hunter, who would become Jerry Garcia's primary lyrical collaborator for the remainder of his life and career with the dead. Uh, the band would play the culturally significant uh, Woodstock Music and Art Fair as well in August 1969, but were famously dismissive of their set, uh, citing technical difficulties and electrical problems. The following November, they would issue Live Dead, which was their first official live album release and the first live rock music album recorded on 16-track. The album featured entire side-long jams and cemented the Dead's reputation as a performing unit to be reckoned with in the public consciousness. In the following months, the band continued to tour heavily, and at the end of January 1970, there was actually a police raid at the hotel that the band were staying at in New Orleans, and a couple of the band members were among 19 people arrested and charged with possession of illicit substances. After returning uh, from their tour somewhat disheartened, they found that uh, their manager Lenny Hart, father of drummer Mickey Hart, had been laundering the group's money for some time. He was roundly fired and fled to Mexico, and that's another that, uh, incident that could be a, a book in and of itself, the whole episode uh, with Lenny Hart. Uh, <laughs> it's quite a, quite, quite a story, honestly, in and of itself. Um, in the aftermath, uh, Mickey Hart took a leave of absence from the band, and concurrently uh, Tom Constantin left the group on amicable terms. It was during this tumultuous time of flux that the band took to Pacific High Recording Studio in San Francisco to record a set of songs that Jerry Garcia and Robert Hunter had written together over the last few months. These songs would take a much less experimental approach and have a more organic and often acoustic sound. These sort of proto-Americana songs would find home in summer of 1970 on the Working Man's Dead album, which would go on to become one of the Grateful Dead's most popular and celebrated works, charting at number 27 on the Billboard Pop Albums chart and going on to be certified gold in 1974 and later platinum in 1986 by the RIAA. After another summer touring in support of the album, uh, the Dead returned to uh, San Francisco to record their follow-up album, this time uh, taking to Wally Heider Studios. Um, and there were a number of other behind-the-scenes changes. Uh, Bob Matthews, who had engineered the two previous Dead albums, was replaced by uh, Stephen Barncard, who had uh, been working extensively with David Crosby and members of Jefferson Airplane, with whom Jerry Garcia had been uh, collaborating frequently uh, with uh, around that time. And unlike uh, Working Man's Dead, which was largely a Garcia Hunter songwriting affair, American Beauty would incorporate compositions by multiple writers in the band, giving spotlight to Weir, uh, Bob Weir, Phil Lesh, and Pigpen. Uh, although still rooted in the Bakersfield sound, Americana styles and country rock crossover like its predecessor, American Beauty places more emphasis on vocal harmonies and sweet melodies. So, uh, hopefully enough background for some context. The uh, album itself, Side A, opens with the propulsive thumping rhythm of Box of Rain, a Phil Lesh composition uh, with lyrics written by Robert Hunter. The first song the Dead had recorded and released with Lesh providing lead vocals. It also features bass guitar from Dave Torbert and lead guitar from David Nelson. 
both of the new writers of The Purple Sage, as Phil Lesh uh, plays acoustic guitar and Jerry Garcia plays piano on the track, as opposed to the regular instruments. Uh, though Hunter wrote the lyrics, the song was heavily inspired by the time in Phil Lesh's life during which it was written, uh, the time in which his father was dying of terminal cancer. In his autobiography, uh, Lesh states that he had mentioned to Hunter that he would be working out the vocals during drives to visit his father, and that must have been enough of a catalyst for Hunter's imagination and inspiration to drive the direction of the, the creative direction of the song. Um, and Hunter himself has since said that, in his case, if ever a lyric wrote itself, this did. Um, there are several liter literary references and quotations of poems and biblical passages. You know, song lyrics like, uh, What do you want me to do? To do for you? To see you through? And lyrics like, uh, Such a long, long time to be gone and a short time to be there uh, are you know, both truly, truly timeless. This is one of the Dead's most accomplished songs, in my opinion. Uh, one of the most accomplished songs of its kind, I should say. And a fantastic beginning to this album. Uh, the song was debuted live on stage September 17, 1970, at, uh, at the Fillmore East in New York City, a few months before the album's release. And hardcore deadheads will know that it was uh, also the very last song the Grateful Dead played as their very last encore at their very last performance with Jerry Garcia at Soldier Field in Chicago, Illinois, July 9th, 1995. And bringing things somewhat full circle, it was also the first song played at the 50th anniversary Fare Thee Well concerts at Soldier Field, July 3rd, 2015. The next track, Friend of the Devil, is without a shadow of a doubt, one of the Dead's most enduring, popular, and classic songs. Uh, Robert Hunter's original lyric was apparently, I set out running, but I take my time. It looks like water, but it tastes like wine. And the Friend of the Devil is a Friend of Mine lyrics were suggested by John Dawson of the new writers of the Purple Sage. Uh, Hunter agreed that the new lyrics both sounded better and expanded the scope of the story from a simple outlaw tale. Hunter originally intended to write lyrics for a new writer's song with Dawson, but Jerry Garcia was brought into the collaboration and one of the Dead's most beloved songs was born complete with a catchy guitar riff and all. The song tells the tale of a convict on the run from the law, forced into a self-perpetuating cycle of outlaw life and unsavory characters. Uh, the song was debuted March 20th, several months before the release of the album, at Capitol Theater in Port Chester, New York and saw its final performance by the Grateful Dead 25 years later, June 24th, 1995, at Robert F. Kennedy Stadium in Washington, D.C. It has become one of the Dead's most covered tunes, with versions by new writers of the Purple Sage, Chris Smither, Bob Dylan, Tom Petty, Elvis Costello, Ramblin' Jack Elliott, John Mayer, Counting Crows, Dave Matthews Band, Mumford & Sons, and plenty of others. Uh, the following track, Sugar Magnolia, is another one of the Dead's most beloved songs. Uh, according to statistics, their second most played song of their entire concert career. Um, the song kicks off with a tasty Garcia guitar lick before the rest of the band jumps into gear, uh, driving rhythm chugging along. Uh, written in collaboration between Bob Weir and Robert Hunter, uh, Hunter actually became fed up with Weir's lyrical adjustments and improvisations in the song, infamously giving him to John Perry Barlow, who would go on to become Weir's primary lyrical collaborator in the following years. Uh, the song is a gently chauvinistic ode to the idealized woman of the singer's dreams. 
a woman who essentially has the singer's back, waits for him off stage, helps him handle his troubles and all that good stuff. The song has such a great energy, a fun country rock romp. It's really dynamite, feel good, boogie music. And the lyrics flirt with psychedelic imagery. She comes skimming through rays of violet. She can wade in a drop of dew. And as Bobby sings about the crying cuckoos and the moon being halfway down, the band shifts from the key of A to the key of B and enters the coda of the song, which in live performances often existed as its own separate song entity, Sunshine Daydream. A climax of sorts to the themes of Sugar Magnolia, celebrating both the fantasy this woman represents and the idea of fantasizing in general. You know, uh, daydreaming in the sunlight. Uh, it's, uh, in live performances, the band, they would usually, uh, make, make a pause, a break of sorts between the Sunshine Daydream and Sugar Magnolia sections, you know, whether it be for a few seconds or, you know, whether they would stick another song in between there or a few songs or shucks, when I saw Dead and Company in 2016 at Alpine Valley, they opened the second set with Sugar Magnolia and closed the second set with Sunshine Daydream, sandwiching the, the rest of the songs in the entire set between the two. And I've, you know, read about uh, in the past how in, in some instances the dead would, you know, play Sugar Magnolia at one show and, and not play the coda of Sunshine Daydream for several shows later. So they would definitely do some creative and fun things with, the, uh, with that uh, concept. But uh, in, in, in these live performances, the band would really just jam out with, with reckless abandon, stretching out, and uh, Bobby would wail and shout himself into a near manic state. It's always the highlight of a show. Um, in the studio recording, it fades out, you know, but again, in a live, in a live setting, it really becomes much more of a, a balls-out rocker, uh, balls-out rock and roll jam than you get on the record. Uh, but in any case, it's certainly one of my all-time favorite Grateful Dead songs uh, and a personal highlight of the album and their entire catalog. Uh, the song was premiered June 7, 1970 at Fillmore West in San Francisco, California and was played as the final song of the second set at the final Grateful Dead concert July 9, 1995 at Soldier Field. Uh, the band would also, it's worth noting, frequently play it uh, at their New Year's, New Year's Eve concerts uh, to usher in the New Year at the stroke of midnight. Uh, really, I could go on. There's a lot to say about this song, and I could say it all. I love this song. Um, the next track, Operator, is a pig pen composition. It starts with some loose percussion and a fun guitar riff. Uh, pig pen, of course, handles lead vocal singing in his uh, bluesy moans about uh, calling a telephone operator to try and find the long-distance number to contact his woman who left on the midnight train. He sings that, uh, you know, he, uh, he sings about various places she might be, but the operator concludes it's a private number, so he can't connect him because that's privileged information. The song is a very laid-back, bluesy boogie with playful instrumentation and a gruff yet bouncy vocal from Pigpen. Nothing too heavy here, just standard classic blues themes. We get a nice little harmonica solo before the conclusion of the song. And it was actually, this song is actually one of the least played of the entire uh, Dead repertoire with only four documented performances, including the debut uh, August 18, 1970 uh, performance at Fillmore West in San Francisco and the final performance barely three months later, November 8, 1970, exactly one week after the release of the American Beauty album at the Capitol Theater in Port Chester, New York. Uh, the next track, Candyman, is a slow-tempo Garcia Hunter composition featuring organ and piano uh, contributions from Howard Wales and Ned Lajan, 
uh, respectively, as well as pedal steel guitar overdubs from Garcia. Another one of the Dead's many gambling songs, uh, a theme they would uh, revisit time and time again throughout their material. Uh, Garcia sings of a man who uh, rolls through town, wins money from the men, loves the women, and leaves. Uh, worth noting is the verse where Garcia sings about a character named Mr. Benson, whom he declares he would blow straight to hell if he had a shotgun. Uh, Robert Hunter has gone on uh, in interviews, has expressed uh, mixed feelings on the enthusiasm the audience uh, typically responds uh, to that song with, but uh, I would think uh, rather than enthusiasm uh, about the idea of violence in the lyric, it's more enthusiasm about uh, anti-authoritarianism, which is certainly a theme explored not only in this song and not only in other songs on the album, but songs throughout the Dead's catalog. Sympathetic outlaws that many of the outcasts and rebels uh, who comprise uh, the majority of the Grateful Dead fan base uh, can identify with. To that end, uh, it was uh, the song was played steadily throughout the band's touring years, first making its way to the stage uh, April 3rd, 1970, at the University of Cincinnati, and uh, its final performance uh, was 25 years later, uh, June 30th, 1995, at Three Rivers Stadium in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, the harmonies, I gotta say, are the harmonies in the chorus are always just beautiful, uh, whether on the original record or in live performances. These guys had really worked out their vocal arrangements spectacularly. And at over six minutes, this is the longest song on the album by over a minute. Um, and as it draws to its conclusion and the vocals and swirling organ fade into the ether, I, uh, find myself stumbling out of a sort of trance-like state the song has induced. And beside A. Side B opens with Ripple, another one of the Grateful Dead's most popular and beloved songs, covered by dozens of artists and featured in popular media to this day. Um, the opening acoustic guitar riff and uh, soft drumming set such a carefree vibe the thumping bass pushes everything along, and the sweet harmonies sit on top of the rich stew that is the song. Great guest mandolin guitar, uh, mandolin guitar, mandolin, uh, from David Grisman, um, on the song is the icing, uh, that makes this song even sweeter. Uh, there's so much to interpret from Hunter's lyrics, um, you know, it's, it touches on themes of attempting to express feelings in song. It touches on biblical references. It contemplates the path of life between the dawn of birth and the dark of death, or the dawn of happiness and the dark of sadness. You know, it, 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 it touches on the personal path each person must walk in life on the fountain that is the source of inspiration, on the Tao of life. There's, there's just so much to unpack in this song. I've seen the chorus described as a haiku, though syllabically it would break mid-word. It would essentially work as a haiku. Um, Robert Hunter has gone on record as saying that the lyrics reach out your hand if your cup is empty. If your cup is full, may it be again. Let it be known there is a fountain that was not made by the hands of men. Uh, he's gone on to on record as saying that is his favorite set of lyrics he has ever written. It's pretty damn good. Uh, this was another one of the songs given its premiere performance at the Fillmore West in San Francisco, uh, August 18th, 1970. And it was resurrected after a few intermittent absences from the stage for a final performance as the second encore uh, on September 3rd, 1988 at the Capitol Center in Landover, Maryland. Uh, it was the first performance of the song in seven years and the first electric performance of the song in 17 years. Uh, 
just as on the original album, in the debut 1970 performance, the song segues directly into the following track, Broke Down Palace, with a page-turning guitar note. Uh, the song tells a story of death, but a beautiful, proud, and peaceful death. It can be interpreted as moving on from any sort of loss in life and accepting the mourning that comes along with it. Uh, images of riverside travel accompany this concept of accepting the flow of life and listening to the sounds of the river for the wisdom of nature and for peace of mind. Uh, one of the most memorable lyrics of the song and of the whole album for me uh, sit at the end of the second verse, Mama, mama, many worlds I've come since I first left home. Robert Hunter has uh, himself been historically ambiguous about these lyrics and concludes that it means whatever the listener wants it to. In the third verse, uh, Garcia sings about planting a weeping willow on the riverbank and sings about how lovers come and go, but the river rolls on. It's simultaneously beautiful, tragic, happy, sad, all of the above. And it's one of the dead's finest. In some ways, I would say it stands out as the crown jewel of the American Beauty album. Uh, the band's final performance of the song was July 2nd, 1995 at the Deer Creek Music Center in Noblesville, Indiana. Uh, Robert Hunter has on multiple occasions told the story of how he uh, wrote the lyrics for Ripple, Broke Down Palace, and To Lay Me Down, a song that would see release on Garcia's debut solo album and be performed by the dead fairly often. Uh, he's spoken about how he wrote those three songs while the dead were on tour in London in a hotel room in one afternoon over a bottle of Retsina wine. Sounds nice. Um, the song features piano contributions from Howard Wales, and again, the harmony vocals from Phil Lesh and Bob Weir are simply sublime. These guys had a unique blend, and as Garcia would say years later, ragged but right. Uh, the next track, Till the Morning Comes, changes the pace quite a bit. An up-tempo country rock number with lively guitars and bright vocal harmonies. The band sings lyrics that I have seen and heard people say in recent years they don't feel have aged well, which I get. It kind of is what it is. It's 70s rock and roll. Chauvinism was a thing. It still is. You're my woman now. Make yourself easy. Uh, the Dead only played this song a small handful of times, something like five times in their entire 30-year career. Um, it was premiered September 18th at the Fillmore East in New York City and given its final outing barely three months later, December 26th in 1970, at El Monte Legion Stadium in California. Uh, in a relatively recent interview, Bob Weir uh, went on record as saying that he just felt the song, quote, hadn't quite grown a face by the time the band had recorded it in the studio and that they just, again, quote, kind of lost interest in it. It is what it is. The next track, Addicts of My Life, slows things down again. Another vague and obscure set of poetic ruminations on life, change, and loss, coupled with a biblical reference or two for good measure. In a recorded conversation with a university student, Robert Hunter, uh, when asked about the meaning of the song, simply said that the best he could say is that you flew to me is an affirmation of the concept of grace adding no this is not a song about being stoned it's a song about the soul hunter's lyrics have garcia weir and lesh harmonizing about feeling a part of the whole universe of being a, a person that has a relationship to something that is greater than oneself. Uh, uh, to, they, they sing about feeling the bird of inspiration fly down. Uh, to fly down to visit. That's you know, kind of one of my interpretations. 
a lovely acoustic ballad filled with more lush harmonies between Jerry, Bob, and Phil. Uh, it was first performed uh, May 14th, 1970 at, uh, Merrimack, at the Merrimack Community College in St. Louis, Missouri. And for the last time, July 2nd, 1995, at the Deer Creek Music Center in Noblesville. Um, and the following track, Truckin', is another one of the Dead's most well-known songs and enduringly popular. Uh, it's seen extensive radio airplay over the last 50 years and even been officially recognized by the United States Library of Congress as a national treasure in 1997. Featuring contributions uh, compositionally from Garcia, Hunter, Weir, and Lesh, the song tells the story of their life on the road over the last five years, seeing different cities that all start to look the same and weighing the typical daydreams of the average person against their own. They sing about how most people that you meet uh, on the street have loved and lost and struggle to get through each day. They sing about being in Dallas, in Houston, in New Orleans, in New York, about trucking up to Buffalo, all places they had really been. The bridge of the song features one of the dead's most iconic and quoted lyrics. Sometimes the light's all shining on me, other times I can barely see. Lately, it occurs to me what a long, strange trip it's been. And that's good shit. It's been appropriated and overused by countless hippies and hipsters over the decades, but it's still good shit. Uh, the third verse uh, debatably features a Velvet Underground reference, What in the World Ever Became of Sweet Jane, uh, which was released as a single in August of 1970, that song Sweet Jane was, uh, by the Velvet Underground, when the uh, and in August of 1970, the dead were in the studio recording the American Beauty album. Um, and fun fact, that Velvet Underground album uh, loaded that that song Sweet Jane was on was released exactly two weeks after the American Beauty album in November of 1970. Fun fact. Um, but uh, there's actually a live performance of the song, uh, from the early 80s, where Bob Weir sings an alternate lyric about Sweet Jane getting a sex change instead of losing her sparkle, as the lyrics on the album are, uh, which has led some to think there might be something to the Velvet Underground connection. And even the studio version, the lyric immediately following is about uh, using downers and cocaine, which is very much Lou Reed territory, as far as lyrics go. Uh, the fourth verse begins detailing the drug bust that the band suffered in New Orleans on the uh, on Bourbon Street in 1970. Um, this style of writing really lends itself uh, to the same tradition of folk music as far as uh, conveying uh, the events of you know real events through music. Uh, the band first performed this song as the first uh, at the first set of their uh, August 18th, 1970 gig at the Fillmore West in San Francisco, California. And it became a concert staple until its final performance on July 6th, 1995 at the River, uh, Riverport Amphitheater uh, in Maryland Heights, Missouri. Though not initially released as a single, the heavy radio airplay and consumer demand led to an edited promotional single release in January of 1971, coupled with Ripple as the B-side. Edited down from five minutes to just over three minutes, there are also several changes to the mix of the instruments and vocal tracks, making the single release essential for completist dead collectors. Uh, the single peaked at number 64 on the U.S. Billboard Pop Singles chart, staying on the charts for eight weeks. Uh, the biggest chart success that the Grateful Dead would have until the surprise smash success of Touch of Grey 16 years later. Uh, the song is not only anthemic for deadheads, but is one of the most clear caricatures of what the band represents to, uh, you know, in the public consciousness. Fucking jams. So, final thoughts. 
This is a truly spectacular album. Uh, nearly flawless by any standard. I've hemmed and hawed over the years about various uh, ways to sort of resequence the album for what I feel would be a somewhat better flow as far as a simple song-to-song -song listening experience, but that's that's nitpicking on my part. This uh, really each song on the album is uh, has got a consistent sound, yet none of them wind up feeling redundant. You know, uh, the Dead completely revamped their sound and approach from their previous albums with the release of Working Man's Dead. Um, by embracing acoustic instrumentation and Americana sensibilities. Um, and then with this album, they continued to lean into that, uh, you know, eschewing the electric feedback and psychedelic effects uh, and continuing to emphasize, again, as I said at the beginning, vocal harmonies and sweet melodies. The, it, it's... Uh, because of this, this reason that uh, you know these two albums really feel to me like brother and sister albums, sharing several qualities, sensibilities, and many songs that were written roughly around the same stretch of months. Uh, both of the albums established the Grateful Dead in a way that their relentless touring had not. Suddenly, they had two albums uh, that uh, were on the charts with several radio hits. Um, just like its predecessor, American Beauty, uh, I believe charted at number 30, according to my notes here, uh, in January of 1971, and remained on the charts for 19 weeks. Certified gold in 1974 and platinum in 1986, like its predecessor, going on to be certified double platinum in 2001. Uh, it made the list uh, all three times for Rolling Stone magazine's 500 greatest albums of all time. Um, so it is definitely rightly uh, lauded as a, something of a masterpiece. Um, give you guys a closer look here. Um, take this out of the shrink so you can see with a bit less glare the picture disc. It's very pretty. Um, and the B-side uh, looks pretty cool too. Usually I'm not too big on picture discs, not only because of the lack of, uh, usual lack of sound quality, but also because even if they have a cool, uh, album cover on the A side, there's usually just a dumb band picture on the B side or something not too exciting, but this looks very cool. Both sides are worthy of display. Um, and yeah, the CD, again, is fairly basic, just a glossy slip cover, as I mentioned, embossed. Uh, I got the, uh, sticker on the back there and uh, it's got gatefold with the tracks of the bonus discs and the personnel in the original track list fun hype sticker mostly uh, trying to hype up people about the remaster and the uh, bonus tracks and it comes with a nice booklet that's got some uh, you know new liner notes and information from the band members and such so, I've been blabbing for over 40 minutes here. I better try to wrap this up. Um, this, as I said, spectacular album, near flawless. I would not hesitate to rate it 10 out of 10. Easily a 10 out of 10 album. Um, listen to it front to back. Time and time again. Not a song that uh, doesn't belong. Again, sometimes I wish they were in a little bit of a different order. But that's a nitpick. So, let me know in the comments below. Are you uh, familiar with the American Beauty album uh, or any other album by the Grateful Dead? Have you heard the Grateful Dead, any of their studio albums, any of their live recordings? Uh, they've got a whole lot of live recordings, both official and unofficial. So uh, yeah, let's get a discussion flowing in the comments. I know this has been a very long video, but uh, there's a whole lot to say about the Grateful Dead and I guess you could make a joke that you know the Grateful Dead don't know when to stop jamming and their fans don't know when to stop fucking blabbing about them and I'm definitely one of those fans so I thank you for anybody that has uh joined me uh for all of this near 45 minute ride um and uh I appreciate any and all viewership uh leave a like and all that good stuff and like I said let's get a discussion flowing in the comments because that's the most fun part of this
Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, this has been Matthew Buckley Talks Music with American Beauty by the Grateful Dead. Music is the best.